Words appear on a black background. The National Park Service Apostle Islands National Lakeshore presents On the Edge of Gichigami, Voices of the Apostle Islands. In an aerial view, densely forested islands sprawl across Lake Superior's calm blue waters. I spend the morning reading scholars' accounts of people early to these shores. Ojibwe, who long ago migrated to Shawamagan Bay. The trappers, traders, voyagers who paddled the unsettled lake. 19th century masons who quarried brownstone in eight by four blocks and chipped it off to Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, as far east as Buffalo. The Apostle Islands have stories to tell. On the edges where water meets land, field meets forest, past meets future, stories are revealed. A deserted homestead in an overgrown wood, the sharp, steep wall of a quarry, a fish tug in dry dock, a lighthouse on a border of land, the crash of waves against the shore. A glowing orange sunset casts a lone sailboat in silhouette. My favorite time of day is sunset. Some people need to just get out here and take a break from the rest of their life. Today we went swimming. Can't do that all the time. And the storm was over the big lake, but seemed reluctant to come into the islands. You can see, you can hear, you can smell, you can watch. It's all about nature. And we found a snake and a turtle, and we learned how a tombola was formed. The lake, from an Indian perspective, is sacred. Historic photos of island folk. People who have experienced the islands become the keepers of stories. Stories of subsistence, sailors, adventure. Stories of diverse cultures that met like ice floes on the lake, sometimes grinding, overriding, sometimes freezing together into a smooth, unbroken union. Sunlight glitters on snow. The voices of all mingle to tell the stories of the apostles, stories still being written. The sun rises over the water. There are 22 apostle islands, if you include Long Island, which technically is not an island now, but a peninsula. Evergreens cluster on a finger of land jutting into the water. Each island has its unique character. Reddish stone cliffs rise up from blue-green water. Waves turn around pillar-like rock formations. The first time that we discovered the backwater here at Julian Bay, all of a sudden realized that there was a whole other world back there that was totally different than the beach. Tube-shaped pitcher plants nestle in tall grass. Dark veins branch out across the roughly edged leaves. Now a lighthouse stands watch on a rocky island. Devil's Island is a chunk of sandstone, so there's very little actual soil. And many of the trees that you see out there look small, but they're actually quite old. The climate out there is pretty rugged. The uh, winters and the fall storms are pretty wild out there. There are quite a few rare plant species associated with Devil's Island. Orchids, sphagnum mosses, mosses of all types. Mushrooms rise from a mossy blanket. It's incredibly beautiful in an old forest. Fuzzy moss surrounds a yellow mushroom. Four dark blue berries tap a fork stem. Frizzy hair like lichen clings to a branch. A frog runs into the bed of dried leaves. If you really want to understand it, you have to see the small stuff along with the big stuff. A short ground pine quivers in a breeze. Red berries cling to branches covered in green needles. Earth star mushrooms have petal like edges. Dewy hairs cover the leaves of a round leaved sundew. The most significant old growth we have in the, in the lake shore is on Outer Island. There's a, just about 200 acres of old growth, white pine and hemlock. The federal government set aside reserves for the lighthouse stations, and those reserves were off limits to loggers. Being in ancient forests is like being out in open seascape where the endless sea creates possibilities for our inner spirit. Ancient forests have a way of doing that where you're in the midst of uh, a landscape that because of its age and its magnitude is powerful enough to do the same thing but in a really different environment. It's like being in a comforter on a cold day. It's like being in a cathedral. 
when you get into these stands of big trees. Massive tree trunks rise above the forest floor and reach toward a blue sky, a hiker on a trail. The people that do come out here and take advantage of the Apostle Islands do it because they're really looking for an adventure. They're looking for something that's going to be a little bit out of the ordinary, a little bit different. The very first time I went to Raspberry Island, I remember that so clearly because as soon as I reached the top of the stairs, I felt like I just walked through a window in time. A man writes at a desk. May 16, 1888. Arrived at the station and commenced lighting up. He carries an oil can with a spigot. May 22nd. Thoroughly cleansed and overhauled apparatus, which is now working well. He approaches a lighthouse. June 17th. Wild strawberries will be plentiful this summer, a few just beginning to ripen. He enters and walks upstairs. August 11, Tug Daisy brought an excursion party who visited the station and expressed their delight over the rural attractions of the place. They were the first visitors of the season. September 18, steam barge Samuel Hodge came near running aground Saturday night during a heavy fog. The captain could not see the light, but fortunately heard the foghorn. Stormy weather from the 16th to the 18th. He steps onto a balcony. September 22nd, birds of passage arrived in great numbers about the 18th, especially yellow hammers and robins. October 22nd, first snow fell this morning. November 30th, extinguished the light for the season, left the station for the winter by permission of the inspector. A massive cargo ship cruises on the water. Lake Superior is an inland sea. It's what made this area important for commerce. The first lighthouses that were built in the Apostles were built with the idea of guiding ships among the Apostle Islands to get to ports within this area. Then the next ring of lighthouses that were built on places like Outer Island, Devil's Island, and Sand Island were built to guide ships past the Apostle Islands. New cities have been built, Duluth, Superior, and suddenly it was not nearly so important to guide ships into Bayfield or to La Pointe, but it was much more important to guide ships from the outside world to Duluth and to Superior. Clouds streak across the sky. Lake Superior is a force. Lake Superior makes its own weather. I like it when we have a storm front moving in. The big water here allows you to literally watch that wall, that storm wall, will wash right towards you. White caps roll into shore. Being out in the islands is really, really interesting because there's all these stories about the lake, the power of Lake Superior, and you have to respect it. And those stories are grounded in truth and, and they're grounded in people having terrible experiences, drowning, shipwrecks. The lake is the boss. The lake is the boss, make no mistake about it. No matter how big you are or what kind of a boat you got, the lake is still the boss. Mother Nature dictates a lot of things. Lake Superior has been known to wreck a lot of ships and there are quite a few right in this area that are quite spectacular. An underwater view floats over the decaying hull of a sunken ship, then a black and white photo of a ship over 200 feet long. The Knock Bay was a lumber schooner and it caught fire and they purposely tried to beach it. And where it rests there, it uh, burned to the waterline and sank. Part of the wreck lies in the shallows. When you look at the shipwrecks of the Apostle Islands, you realize that the lives of the sailors are part of the price that was paid for the nation's industrial expansion. When we look at the farmers, the fishermen who scratched out a living on the islands, I think we owe it to them to preserve the memory. And you can't talk about the history of the islands without remembering the one basic fact is that this is the ancestral homeland of native peoples who consider this the center of their world. This lake is Kichigami, Kichigami. That's how you say that in Ojibwe. Centuries and centuries ago, the Ojibwe people migrated here, or moved here, traveled here from out east. They knew that they were coming to this. This wasn't a surprise. This is the place where they were supposed to be going. 
Ojibwe people today are proud of who they are, are continuing with the traditions that they always have been doing. A woman in leaves this a basket. Place. Agama Mitik, that's the black ash tree. Agamamakak, that's the black ash basket. I feel a great connection with these baskets. I like it that the trees grow so close to our home. When I think about these baskets, I think about my ancestors and how they lived long ago and how they used these baskets. I really enjoy doing this, and it is something that I'm able to pass on to the people over at Bad River and other communities. With any culture group, it's very important to carry on your traditions and your culture, to know who you are. Seagulls flock around a fishing boat. I'm a commercial fisherman out of Bayfield, Wisconsin. I'm the fourth generation come over from uh, Norway in the early 1900s. Basically, I fished even when I was a young kid with my dad. Usually in the summertime, you try to get up and be on the lake before five. And try to be back in by two. He tosses a flopping fish into a crate. Hopefully I'll be able to do this another 20 years or so. A few rustic cabins occupy a rocky shoreline. This is Manitou Island. It was a bachelor's fish camp. It operated summer and winter. A lot of these men had no investment at all. This was the bottom level of commercial fishing. They sold all their fish to the fisheries. And a lot of them didn't own a boat. And if they had a boat, it was probably shared. A photo shows three young men in overalls and newsboy caps. The Hulkinsons were three brothers that were born in the late 19th century. They started this fishery in about 1927. These people owned what they had. They were capitalists. They were middle-class businessmen. They owned everything, and they were trying to maximize their profits. And there were many fishermen like them, many family-owned fishing businesses along this coastline. Vegetation surrounds rusty pieces of equipment. The things we see on the islands today are human footprints in the history of the islands. They may seem to some people like junk, but what they are really are mementos of island life. They are the tracks of time across these islands. Overgrown tracks cut through the woods. You know, it's something over a hundred years now since my father came here, along with many other foreigners. And some of them you know, went into the lumber camps. In a little bit less than two generations, all those trees were gone. A mountain of stacked lumber towers over a worker. I'm kind of fascinated by these people that would actually come out onto these islands and try to farm and, and eke out a living out here. It must have been quite a challenge back in the early days. Kids watch as two men pull a fishing net from a hole in the ice. Lily pads float on a pond and delicate purple flowers sway on leafy stems. We love to come here because of the unspoiled natural beauty. Smooth bean-like pods hang between broad leaves. The beach is gorgeous. The wildlife around it is fantastic. A black bear roams through the woods. An otter dips underwater. We've got probably the most diverse collection of sand spits in the entire Great Lakes region. They're in some of the most pristine condition. Wispy green grass grows in a bed of fine sand. A brown and white bird pecks at a wet shoreline. An eagle soars toward an island. It's a really important area for migratory birds, especially Outer Island Sandspit and Long Island. A long sandy peninsula extends out into the water. Gull Island is our largest colonial bird colony. And what's real striking there is you've got a three acre island that has a thousand colonial bird nests. Birds float on the water surface. A kayaker paddles through gentle waves. For me, it's a little bit more about the water than it is about the islands. Uh, it's just that the islands create safe havens. And you can't paddle all the time. You gotta stop somewhere. And then it just sort of turns out that the islands are spectacular, so it's been a great relationship. Kayaking here, you've got the islands, so you've got a constant variety, and all the islands are different. And the water is crystal clear. There's something for everybody here. A yacht motors past a sailboat. This is a sailor's paradise. A cormorant swims near a sailboat, dipping its head in and out of the water. Our family passion is sailing, and so we charter a sailboat. 
try to check out different parts of the islands each time we're up here. People ride an inflatable raft. I suppose as a favorite, it's uh, going through the caves on Devil's Island. Those caves have been eroded over you know, hundreds of thousands of years. When the wind is right and everything, you can get out there and take a dinghy and go through the caves. I've traveled all over the world. This is one of the most beautiful spots in the world here. Time almost stands still in the Apostle Islands. It definitely slows down. You start to feel like you're living and a day lasts a while instead of just wake up and go to bed. In an old photo, people gather near the water. This area has been attractive to tourists for quite a long time. It has been well known as, as a destination for people to come and to participate in outdoor activities and to experience the, the beauty and the, the natural wonders of the area. We can go back to the middle of the 19th century and, and read accounts of people who came to the Apostle Islands to, uh, to vacation, to fish, to hunt. A woman swings a mallet. We certainly have records of people playing things like croquet out on the lighthouse lawns. That tradition continues today. Rocky water turns around rock formations. Orange monarch butterflies flutter over purple blooms. We've come at different seasons, and it's always beautiful. It's always interesting. Reddish-orange leaves hang over a sandy beach. Then snow clings to an evergreen branch. Walls of ice and snow flank the entrances to rocky caves. There's the mainland caves in, uh, in the winter when the ice forms up enough to get out there. And uh, get out there at sunset because it faces west, and you have these long, daggers of ice coming down from the top of the caves and you can slide back into them. It's like being in the heart of the winter. Soft sunlight glows on a sheet of bumpy ice. Being up here in the wintertime, it's totally different. It has a beauty all its own. It's almost like looking over a desert, but it's a desert of snow. It's just so still you can actually hear the silence. A full moon rises in a black sky. Oh, I love the peepers in spring. Dense fog washes over a wooded lowland. Water droplets rest on blades of grass like smooth glass beads. A lady slipper with a pink pouch-like body and slender petals hangs from a thick stalk. It's fun to follow the seasons and just notice both what you see and what you hear, the different wildlife and, and things coming alive, the ferns unrolling themselves. It's always amazing. A man lounges in a chair in shallow water. It's kind of a tropical Northwoods paradise as far as I'm concerned. People ride in an excursion boat. Summer is, is a spectacular time because you have access to the lake. You get to visit all of the different islands and lighthouses. Each one of them is unique and different. And, uh, you learn the history of them, you learn the stories of them. A date on a stone building reads 1881. A sunset is viewed through a lighthouse lens. Bright autumn leaves blanket a forest. I particularly enjoy the fall. The only problem with fall is it's just too short. Golden leaves top aspen trees. Sunlight peeks through fiery red foliage. A crimson maple leaf rests on a green fern. Unless you know the history and have seen these old photographs, you look at it and you think, they're pristine. Man has never touched here. Well, man has. And the resiliency of nature gives one hope because we are human. We will leave footprints. We will make mistakes. We will leave scars on the land for however good our intentions. We should strive to keep our intentions good and keep those footprints to a minimum. But eventually, the lake and the wind and the rain and the snows will have their way and the islands will continue. To know wild places are out there, to know wild places exist just as something for your soul. And I think it's part of the human condition. Yellow needles tremble in a breeze. The sound of wind when it's blowing through different types of trees. It can make music. I want my grandchildren and their grandchildren to be able to experience all this. Waves wash over a sandy beach. It's a place that feels eminently human. It's not just a howling wilderness. You have the lighthouses, you have the 
farms, you have the human touches even on the islands, and yet you can walk away from those and be in the wilderness. So it's a place that's got that combination of human touches and the natural world, and it shows that the two can coexist. Fade to black. Words appear over footage of lapping waves. Seated beside brown water, I practice the art of stones. Wait with the patient trees for a thrush's news of what the next season will bring. Michael Van Stappen. Credits roll. Producer, director, and editor, Ann Tubiolo. Cinematographer, Steve Ruth. Associate producer, Michelle Hartley. Music composed and performed by Bobby Horton. Writer, Susan Neckrath. Narrator, Tess Monroe. Opening poem, Apostle Island History. Excerpt from San Island Succession. Written and read by Judith Strasser. Ending poem, Autumn Ritual. Excerpt from Whatever Comes Next, Poems of the Apostles. Production assistant, Valerie Coffey. Executive producer, Myra Deck. Special thanks to the following for lending their voices. Craig Charles, April Stone Ball, Rob Gosselin, Grant Herman, Neil Hauk, Karen Larson, Judy Van Staffen, Audrey Wood, and more. Commercial fishermen, Marty Erickson. Historic reenactors, Hope McLeod, Jasmine Bowers, and Joe Darling. Recording services, Marv Nahn, Wisconsin Public Radio. Production, Henninger Media Services, Arlington, Virginia. Online editor, Larry Duke. Interview transcriptions, Shirley Wilt. With appreciation and thanks, Myra Duck, Neil Hauk, Susan Mackrath, Bobby Horton, Bob Mackrath, Betsy Bartelt, Jeff Smith, Rob Goslin, and more. Words read, National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. All rights reserved.